As we were saying before, a capacitor is a passive electrical device that uh, essentially can store DC electricity. I, I, I say DC electricity because AC capacitors behave very differently. I'll explain that in a moment. Now, the electrical potential energy is stored in a material called a dielectric, which is uh, a chemical that separates two conductors. This would normally prevent the flow of electricity, but in this case, it, it, it allows that dielectric can be charged and then discharged. Now, the unit of uh, capacitance is measured in farads. Now, a farad is a very large unit, okay? In the electronics that you guys are going to be working with, you're practically going to be working with a microfarad. Now, there's the definition of a farad from Wikipedia. You can read that. Um, there are several different types of capacitors, fixed capacitors, uh, which you're going to see fairly frequently, polarized capacitors, which typically are more powerful than fixed capacitors, um, but they're not as frequent. And then variable capacitors, I haven't actually worked with any variable capacitors ever before. Now, remember, capacitors block the flow of DC current. Okay, they block the flow of DC current because the capacitor, the, the, the DC current flows into the capacitor, the capacitor charges, but it can't pass through. Um, when the capacitor is fully charged, the electrons, uh, it will stop conducting electricity. So there are a lot of uses of capacitors, not just to charge electricity, but to function as a timer. Okay, each capacitor has a definite uh, charging curve and this can be calculated so timers are created a lot of times using uh, what's known as a CR circuit or a capacitive resistive circuit. Um, now uh, capacitors don't have any effect on AC current because with AC current the uh, the electrons are moving back and forth. So think of a capacitor as kind of like a rubber membrane in the way of a hose. Okay, Imagine if it's a rubber membrane that doesn't break. Now, you just like you can actually break a rubber membrane, you can actually burn through a capacitor fairly easily, but um, in, in this case, imagine that it's, it, it's non-breakable. So you attach it to a hose, it'll, if, you, if, you have, if, the ho or if you put it in the middle of a hose, let's say the hose is full of water and you have a rubber membrane that prevents flow, as you put water in one end, what's going to happen is that as that rubber expand, or the rubber membrane expands in the hose, it's going to move water out of its way and it'll, so, the, uh, so it'll flow to a certain point. And then when it gets to a point where it can't expand anymore, you're going to have no more um, water movement out of the other end. Okay, so that's kind of like how capacitors work. They're not like batteries. They, they work com on a completely different principle. Uh, there's a link for a video that kind of explains how uh, the difference of uh, AC and DC uh, currents work with capacitors. So you can click that and, and watch that. Now, that also brings me to another difference between AC and DC, and that is the difference between impedance versus resistance. Now, um, Impedance or resistance is represented like in Ohm's law, pi, uh, V equals I times R. Resistance is represented by R. Uh, impedance is represented by Z in a lot of these equations. Now, it exists in DC circuits, but typically impedance is really only is, is only um, considered in uh, AC circuits. Now, resistance, DC resistance, is just one element of overall impedance for AC circuits. There's also um, opposition uh, of AC electricity due to capacitance of the conductors and also inductance. You guys know what inductance is, right? No, you don't know what it is. I haven't explained it. So let's explain it really quick. Inductance is a property of electricity to be induced in a conductor, okay? Not through a cell. For example, a generator. When you pass a magnet over a coil of wire repeatedly and at a steady rate, you are generating the flow of electrons. Okay, that is known as induction. An example of induction is when we were, when I was working in a building installing network cable, uh, one of the electricians put a, uh, a large flor uh, fluorescent light inside the building. All right, he put it on in, in the ceiling. It was a drop ceiling, and we had these cables running around up there for network cables. 
all of these network cables were getting in his way, so he decided he'd be helpful, and he coiled up the network cables and put them on the most stable surface in the drop ceiling that was right on top of the fluorescent ballast. Now, fluorescent light bulbs, or fluorescent ballasts generate a whole lot of voltage. A uh, very high voltage, fairly low current. Now, this high voltage causes a lot of induction. And when he placed a coiled up network cable on top of the ballast, it really killed their network connection across that link. So to fix the problem, all I had to do was take the network cable and zip tie it up to the rafters higher than the ballast, but it was about two feet out of range, so that fixed the problem. Now, that was a, uh, that took me about an, two hours to figure out what the problem was, but it took me about three minutes to fix it once I found the problem. All caused by induction. So now that we've gotten that out of the way, let's talk about what an op amp is. Now an op amp, in, by definition, produces an output voltage that is the difference between two input terminals multiplied by the gain. Um, it allows you to take a low signal and turn it into a high signal while doing a fairly good job of keeping the signal fidelity. It's used in all sorts of amplification. For example, turning smooth jazz into death metal. You take a low signal or a small signal and turn it into a much greater signal by multiplying it by a specific gain. Now, they are very versatile and they're used in a lot of applications, not just amplification. Um, it can amplify, but it also is used in filtering systems, signal processing, and communication. Now, it uses a concept called gain. Now, any of you guys have ever used a guitar amp or any other amplifier that had a knob that said gain? What's the difference between gain and volume? Any, any takers? Yep. It's not necessarily getting, uh, like it's progressively getting louder compared to one. Not exactly. With gain, you're amplifying the input signal. With volume, you're amplifying the output signal. Okay, so you can have distortion. With, when you increase the gain, typically you're going to be keeping the signal fidelity a little bit better. Now, gain is represented with the capital letter A, not like amps being represented by the capital letter I, for example. They just do that to be confusing, I think, sometimes. But gain, a lot of times in these equations, will re be re represented by capital A, so be aware of that. Now, you need to be able to draw a symbol for an operational amplifier as well. Now, there are inverting and non-inverting inputs. You'll have a, a power supply, and in this case, we're going to assume 15 volt power supply, positive and negative. Now, this is the symbol for an operational amplifier. On the left side, you have your inverting and non-inverting inputs. The top, the bottom, you have your output um, or your uh, your power supply, and on the right side of this one, you have your output uh, line. Now, in an ideal op amp, the resistance between the positive and negative, or the inverting and non-inverting input inputs, is going to be infinite. Uh, and the resistance at the output is going to be zero. However, this never happens due to constraints of the physical materials. So they're manufactured to get as close as possible. An example of an op amp in use would be the very common 741 chip. Now this is known as a DIP package, D-I-P, which stands for dual inline package. Okay, you guys have learned about this before? I'm seeing some people nodding or no. All right, guess not. Now, a DIP package, you've seen these chips, right? When we worked with the Arduinos, you saw them. Now, they, are, they have specific um, circuits and logic that goes on inside these packages. 741 is an op amp uh, that has a gain of about two, uh, what is that? How many zeros is that? One, two, three, four, five, two, and a lot of zeros. Uh, newer op amps uh, or more powerful op amps have much higher gains. Um, now you'll see this is what's known as the pinout diagram on the right side. The pinout uh, shows you the circuit and shows you what each pin is used. You'll see not a lot of times an eight pin package is a very common dip configuration, uh, but not all the pins are being used. 
So just be aware of that. You also need to be aware of terms called saturation. Now, saturation uh, in waveforms is when the output voltage is close to or greater than the power supply. Um, since signals are going to travel in waves, there is a positive threshold at the, very, at, the, at the top and then a negative threshold at the bottom. You'll see here the red line at the top indicates your positive threshold, the blue line on the bottom indicates your negative threshold, and what happens is the signal goes through, or as it's being amplified past a certain point, the power supply cannot push that signal any higher, so it levels off at the top. This is known as clipping. Okay? In audio amplification, it, it gets a very specific effect when you have clipping and limiting. You get a very specific type of distortion that you can pick up on. Now, you can use an op amp as what's called a comparator. Now, a comparator is a, um, a device that what it does is it takes an analog signal, like an audio signal, and converts it into a digital output. Okay, you take um, your input signal, which is represented by V in in this diagram on the left side, using the op amp and several resistors, for example, this is the LM311 DIP package. Um, it uh, uses the uh, supply voltage as a comparator, and then it determines um, kind of uh, when, the, when the analog signal passes above or below a certain threshold, it indicates, it, it, it outputs that as a digital signal. What it looks like and this is a non-inverting, or if the non-inverting input is higher voltage than the inverting input, you'll have positive saturation. Um, that basically means is you are saturating your upper limits and it can't get a higher, um, any, the voltage can't be any higher. Um, in an inverting input, it would be the opposite way. So it would go from, um, you wouldn't be able to get any any lower on it, if you will, rather closer or farther negative, I should say. Now, resistors can be used to provide a vol voltage divider circuit. I don't know how we got to that point, going from op amps all the way back to resistors. This is like I was talking about potentiometers, so I guess you do have to be aware of it in this case, but it's... Um, pretty straightforward using a potentiometer, but in this case uh, they're using the supply voltage uh, and the resistors to create an output voltage. Now the output of this signal is going to produce a, um, it's going to be an output voltage that's a fraction of the input voltage that you can see explained by the equation at the top right there. Now how do we actually apply this? You use resistors, and this is actually a pretty simple concept. Um, you have a voltage, um, actually we're about done with this presentation, or about done with this video, so let's jump to the next video before I explain this one.